All right, hi everyone. I hope you can see my screen. It is time for it. yeah, it is time for our Friday forecasting talks. And today we're pleased to host uh, Christoph uh, Bichnow and Russell Akai. And they will be talking about hierarchical forecasting for manufacturing. But before they do that, I'll say a couple of words about the center uh, that is hosting this. So this slide shows all the people that we have in the center. Okay, all the senior people, more or less senior. We don't have PhD students on the slide. And uh, different services that we provide and expertise that we have. And with the services, you can see we can we have consultancy, master projects, different ways how we can interact with uh, companies. So if you're interested in um, looking into a specific aspect of your process or something like that, uh, you can get in touch with us and we will find a, a way to work with you. And we have expertise in, a, as I say, a variety of topics, marketing analytics, supply chain forecasting, inventory management, which is not in the list for whatever reason. And obviously forecasting, we actually have extensive expertise in forecasting. That's why it is in the title of the center. Uh, yeah, and we have people with different interests, uh, with some of them focusing on judgmental forecasting, the others focusing on machine learning, uh, in inventory management, and so on. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, keep in touch with us. There are different ways how to do that. There is Twitter account, you can follow us. We have LinkedIn, you can just send us a direct email. We still check emails, yes. Uh, we have our website, we can see all the services we provide and uh, have contact details there. And we have our YouTube channel, which we use for different videos that we record, including this video that will be recorded and uploaded on YouTube in today's webinar. Right, you can scan this QR code to get access to all these um, links directly. Okay, that's uh, that's it from me, a short introduction. So I think we can move to the presentation and to our guests. Can you please start sharing your screen? Awesome. Yeah, thank you a lot, uh, Ivan, for organizing the event. Uh, happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Christoph Pichnow. I am co-founder and CEO of Quantix. Um, we are a company that specializes in demand forecasting, demand planning and supply chain planning for manufacturing companies. And we're happy to talk today about hierarchical forecasting for manufacturing in more detail and happy to provide you with some more insights. Um, I myself have a background in the supply chain management, have been working before a long time for SaaS companies, helping global leading manufacturers to optimize their supply chain. And I'm now more on the marketing side uh, of Quantix. With me here today is our chief data scientist and also associate researcher at the University of Vienna, Ursula Akai, who will be in the background during the presentation. But is happy to get your more technical questions after the presentation and to answer them. Rasul also is um, chairman of the um, Time Series Analysis and Forecasting Society, um, where he tries to bring together forecasting experts like you, but also practitioners to bring together the best in time series forecasting and analytics and to gain new insights. Great. So then let's dive into the topic for today. So what are we going to look at today is hierarchically forecasting for manufacturing. And we first want to be to emphasize what are the specific challenges in a manufacturing environment from business needs, but also looking at data patterns which exist, what makes it difficult to forecast, what information is available, and then going to hierarchical time series. What does it mean? What methods can be used? And what innovative approaches can be applied to derive the best possible forecast to support business in their supply chain planning initiatives. So let's first start. What are the business needs or the challenges in demand forecasting and planning in manufacturing? So typically, when you look at a manufacturing company, you have a lot of different stakeholders from production, which is concerned about making sure that everything runs fine on the production floor, logistics and supply chain, finance, general management, and all of them have different business needs. 
especially when it comes to the, the level of aggregation where they need information, but also with regards to the forecast horizon and the data frequency. While the colleagues from production might be interested in having daily or weekly data for the next couple of weeks ahead on a level like plant product variant, which is required for them for production planning, the colleagues from supply chain might need different information. Like for example, if you want to optimize outbound shipments, you might need to know from which plant the products are shipped to which customer sold to address or to which transport zone or even inco terms and other information. And they might be more interested in getting a forecast for the next three months ahead. On contrast, colleagues from finance might be more interested in aggregate forecasts for different business units or sales organizations and for 18 months forecast horizon. So what you have is a lot of different stakeholders that have very different needs with regards to forecasting and business planning. And that makes it challenging when you try to create consensus within the organization and provide a consistent plan um, for the supply chain planning activities. Now, many use cases when it comes to production and supply chain, they need a very disaggregate level of information. And getting good forecasts on those levels is super, super tricky for manufacturing data. Why is that the case? We're just going to look at it in a second. But what it often leads to is that many departments create their own forecasts. So my finance might have a forecast, supply chain has a different, and maybe also production has a different one. And this leads to inconsistencies because everybody is basically pursuing different plan. Now let's have a look at what kind of challenges exist with regard to the data. So when we look at this comparison, also with regard to the data, we're thinking about manufacturing companies and not just the ones that are selling to B2C, but in particular also companies which are more upstream in the supply chain, companies that typically sell to other B2B clients. In such cases, it's often very tricky to get demand data. Often it's not really tracked at those companies. There is no POS system which records it or a web shop. So typically what you get for forecasting is not really demand data, but it's historic sales or even past shipments. That makes it challenging in that regard that it's not just demand information and demand fluctuations that impacts your forecast, but it's also the behavior in the company <clears throat> from production plans to shipment plans that really impact your forecasting and planning activities. So you need to consider also them when you want to derive the best possible forecast. That makes it really challenging in most organizations. On the other hand side, when we look at the, the data patterns that we see there, often there are different data sources and many inputs in the ERP system are manual or semi-manual and often you will face a lot of data errors also in the system, which is low data quality, which can be quite a pain when you're trying to optimize your forecasting methods to provide the best possible forecast. Although when we're more upstream in the supply chain, it's not just demand fluctuations that you deal with from the end consumer, but it's the whole purchasing behavior of your supply chain partners that will impact your sales. And I think we have seen it in the last couple of years, 2021, everybody was, or 2020, 2021, was in a rush to get inventory, to get hold of inventory because of supply chain disruptions. Then there was a lot of inventory stock up over the last year. And now companies are basically trying to get rid of the inventory. But once you're more upstream in the supply chain, you now had a peak last year uh, with deliveries and now there are less orders incoming. So you're also dealing with those fluctuations which are caused by the ordering policies of your B2B clients and the bullwhip effect in the supply chain. What is also tricky when it comes to forecasting is Compared to retail, it's not that one client just buys a very small quantity, but typically they buy quite large quantities. And they're not just doing this all the time continuously, but typically they buy certain batches and you might need a truckload or even a shipload to provide it to your clients. So that means when you look at your customers, when one customer is not buying, it has already quite an impact on your sales. And on the other hand side, when you are on a disaggregate level, for example, looking at customer sold to ship to, you will have a lot of intermittent demand caused by those bad shipments. So your forecasting solution need to be able to deal with those um, challenging 
situation and must be robust enough um, to provide good forecasts on a continuous basis. Also, when we look at demand signals, which can be leveraged to further improve your forecast, it can be a bit challenging. Typically, you will not have high quality demand signals with a lot of predictive power, like point of sales data in retail or promotions. Sometimes promotion data is available, but many companies don't maintain it in a structured way so that you can really train your models and use your future promotion calendar to leverage it for forecasting in the future. Sometimes available is information related to, to prices, but also with regard to inventory and logistics, which of course is important, as we said, because probably we're forecasting sales or even shipment. So our forecasts will be impacted um, by those factors. When we go outside of the company, we have different data sources that we can leverage. Of course, public holidays or events like Ramadan in certain regions can be helpful to take into account when forecasting but also better macroeconomic data or commodity prices can have an impact depending on your line of business and how your sales processes look like. But it also needs to be said that, for example, macroeconomic data needs to be handled with caution because you just cannot, you cannot just take the data like a promotion data where you have a promotion calendar for the future. You can learn from the past impact of those promotions but with macroeconomic data, you often rely either on forecasts from, for example, central bank, or you need to forecast certain indicators maybe by yourself. And those forecasts, of course, also can introduce errors in your planning activities. Also, when you look at macroeconomic information, there's often quite a considerable time lag between a change in indicator and when it really impacts your business. So it's not just enough to take into account when those variables changes, but also taking that time lag into account. And finally, there's also the question, does it really help you to achieve the goals of you as a manufacturing organization to take those variables into account? Let's, for example, take inflation. Um, inflation might have an explanatory power when you look at your company on an aggregate level, for example, for a certain country or region. But when you really want to optimize your forecast for your colleagues on the production floor, it might not be helpful because on a relationship plant customer sold to, it might just introduce noise to your data. It might not be helpful for forecasting itself. So it's a bit of trade-off and it needs to be considered when setting up your forecasting um, for your manufacturing client. Now, what we have in contrast to other use cases, maybe in manufacturing with B2B clients, we typically have a sales team, sales reps, which are out in the field, which are close to the customer which engage with the customer and which can have very valuable information that you can take into account to improve your demand forecasting and demand planning initiatives. But what we also often see for many manufacturing companies that it's a challenge to get your team motivated to do those forecast updates on a continuous basis. When you have weekly or monthly rolling forecasts, it can be quite an effort. And of course, your sales team might be more interested in selling your products than providing the best possible forecast. So you also need to engage them, give them the tools, the time and the processes to really provide value to your forecast. On the other hand side, typically when you have B2B clients, uh, at least for some big clients, often there are some customer forecasts available, but it is in many cases not the situation that those forecasts are very good. Also, of course, your customers might have different goals than providing you the best forecast. They also want to ensure that basically you have enough capacity to deal with any um, demand variations on their side. But in the end, you have your sales team, which can really contribute improving the forecast and helping you to improve your supply chain planning activities. Now, trying to a bit summing up those key challenges and, and the situation for demand forecasting and planning in manufacturing. On the one hand side, of course, business will always ask you to provide the best possible demand forecast so that they can make smarter decisions about production, about logistics, about investments. But on the other hand side, you have data challenges and many use cases, especially from production and logistics, require a very disaggregate level. And we know forecasting on those levels is really tricky. On the other hand side, you don't want to have forecasts for different business units which don't match 
that don't add up. So you need to have a coherent forecast that is integrated, that is co consistent across different aggregation levels, but also potentially about different and temporal hierarchies. And finally, you have a sales team that can help you improve the forecast, but um, it can take a lot of effort to bring those people really on board um, to give their best, to contribute to the best possible forecast. Now, let's take a step back, just look at hierarchical time series and aggregation levels. What kind of aggregation levels exist anyway in manufacturing and how can different forecasting approaches be leveraged to make sense out of them and to derive most value considering those challenges in manufacturing? Now, when you forecast demand for manufacturing companies, you have a lot of related time series that you need to predict. There might be different locations, different products, different time frequency, weekly, monthly, but they're all related. Now, hierarchical time series basically means that you can organize this data in hierarchical structure, and you typically have multiple aggregation levels that we will dive into in more detail. Different approaches exist, how you can handle this and derive value. It's important to note that for some message with forecast in multiple levels, that there are certain forecast reconciliation processes um, to make sure that you have a coherent forecast across all those levels. But now let's just look what kind of location or organizational aggregation levels typically exist in manufacturing. So if you're doing it for a whole organization, you might have a global level, then typically you have some kind of a regional level. You might have your business units, which sell to different market segments, sales organizations, where your um, sales representatives might also be allocated. Below that, you might have your production plants or afterwards your warehouse and terminals from which you distribute the products to the customer. And finally, you will have your customer sold to and the which, in the which will ship to addresses to which you need to deliver. What we also see for some clients that they also have other information in there, like the dispatch mode or inco terms, to further take those things into account to optimize their outbound um, transport activities. Moving from locations with regard to aggregation levels to the products. So on products, quite similar. You might have on top certain product segments or categories which can be grouped. They can be Proved maybe by the usage of the product and what industries is your product used, the product groups or families that you have, and the product variants, the individual product um, inversions that are being sold, but also can be related to that the packaging type, which is used to dispatch those products to your clients. <clears throat> and finally, there are also temporal aggregation levels. So typically for your SNOP process, you might have weekly or monthly frequency, um, but it also can go down to daily frequency, especially when you're more um, working for production related use case. So also here we have hierarchies which can be taken into account. Now let's have a look what different forecasting types exist and especially with regard to hierarchical forecasting, what approaches can be leveraged to address those challenges um, in manufacturing demand forecasting and planning. So as you're probably, most of you are experts anyway in forecasting, which are attending this meeting. Um, I don't need to explain that there are different model types, model families, forecasting strategies and forecasting approaches with regard to um, hierarchical forecasting. But what is important to note, there's no one perfect method. There's always just a method which performs best considering the given data, the goal, how to optimize the forecast and also the constraints. So when thinking about manufacturing data um, and thinking about these hierarchies and aggregation level, basically, that we talked before, to achieve a coherent forecast and to provide the best possible forecast also on the disaggregate levels, there are different approaches that you can basically leverage. So the easiest approach probably is to just use a top-down approach. In this case, you would be here on this total level, you have one time series, you predict this, and then you use a method to break it down to all the other levels um, of your hierarchy. Another approach, which is a bit similar to it, 
goes to the to the middle time series, middle out approach, forecasts there, and then basically aggregates up and breaks it down to the bottom level. But the approach that we most typically see used by manufacturing companies, which has have been using the leading solutions on the market, or maybe not satisfied, uh, engage their own data science team to come up with a solution is typically the bottom up approach. So in this case, you really go to the bottom time series. In this case, this will be five time series on this chart here. You forecast there, and then you aggregate the data up to get your hierarchy. Now, when looking at top down and bottom up, they both have different advantages and disadvantages. Top down, I said, you very aggregate data, quite smooth. It's much easier to forecast, but you lose a lot of information because you're just viewing the data from a very aggregate level. On the other extreme, the bottom up approach, you're on a very detailed level. As I said, we have intermittent demand. Um, you will have a lot of noise in your data, and it's hard to predict those individual time series. What is important, and that is especially relevant for advanced reconciliation methods, those time series, they are connected. So it's possible to create value from learning across those time series. That's basically also the goal with advanced reconciliation methods. For example, in the, how we approach it is that we forecast not on the top level, the middle level, or bottom level, just on one of them, but we forecast on all. So in this example here, it would be forecasting on eight time series, and then basically using a reconciliation method to create one coherent forecast. What is the benefit of that maybe? <clears throat> so when you're on the bottom up approach, you just said you're forecasting the most disaggregate time series, and then you just add up the results to come up with your more aggregate levels. The problem is in this case that we ignore any relationships which exist. The products belong to a product group. The products are sold maybe in a region which belongs to a state or a sales org. And all this information is basically lost by just forecasting them individually. Especially on bottom time layers or <clears throat> very disaggregate data, there's a low signal to noise ratio. That makes it also very hard to predict. The benefit is, of course, you get a coherent forecast. You can just add it up and you don't lose a lot of information. But it's tricky to get good results um, and get good results so that your production and logistics team basically can optimize their use cases that they have. Now, with advanced reconciliation methods and forecasting on all level, um, you basically not just forecasting on this bottom level, but you're also forecasting, for example, on plant level, on region level, on overall level, and you're then reconciling those in one coherent forecast. It makes it more tricky in a sense that, as said before, there is no one best forecasting method. There's always a forecasting method which performs best on a data. So it's not just good enough to select one forecasting method, but you need to select different forecasting methods for different levels to really be able to provide best results. And of course, this is a bit more effort when it comes to model selection, hyperparameter tuning, and also combining model into hybrid models to create best forecasts. But the benefit is, on the one side, get a coherent forecast, and you can learn across those time series. And this has shown to improve forecast accuracy, not just on the same like level, like for example, on the most disaggregate level, like the bottom up approach, but also on higher levels. And we have also seen for, for our clients that we can um, improve forecast accuracy on bottom levels of up to 70%, of course, depending a bit on the forecast horizon on how they're set up. Um, but there's big potential to improve, especially also on those very disaggregate time series, which are so relevant um, in manufacturing to address use cases in production and logistics. Now, just a quick word on what we at Quantix are basically providing with our solution. So we um, started back in 2020 as a team of data scientists and supply chain experts with the goal to provide really for manufacturing companies a forecasting solution that can give them the best considering their data, which can be very tricky to forecast. So our solution uses hierarchical forecasting techniques and advanced reconciliation methods. We select basically for every individual time series and for every level, what is the best forecasting methods. We combine models into <clears throat> hybrid models if it provides value. And we have a pool of a lot of methods from uh, statistical machine learning to deep learning, which can be leveraged to provide 
the best forecast for our clients. So you can think of basically that the solution is like a, a data science team which continuously screens your data. And when the data changes, when the, the variance, the mean of the data changes, it automatically selects for each level the best forecasting methods. It reconciles them and gives our clients the forecast in different level and provides them with one coherent forecast. And the forecast is also not just coherent across aggregation levels, um, but also we combine short-term, medium-term, long-term forecasts to really have also forecasts that can address the different use cases um, which exist also with regards to the time horizon, which is required by the different business units in your company. We as Quantix, um, we offer to our clients solutions, especially in, in the focus to demand and sales forecasting. As said, we're an expert for manufacturing data and help manufacturing companies on multiple continents from South America, North America to Europe with our forecasting solutions. We're working mainly for, I would say, more heavy industry companies with up to 25 billion in annual revenue, reference customers, for example, Monty. And we're really looking forward to basically, yeah, learn and improve continuously the forecasting to provide our clients with best possible results. If um, you are also curious about how your company or how you could improve in uh, manufacturing supply chain planning. We have uh, currently a webinar series going on. It's called 21st Century Supply Chain Planning. Previously, uh, Eric Wilson from the Institute of Business Forecasting and Planning was joining. Next week, there will be a webinar about um, leveraging um, digital twins uh, for production scheduling. So we're happy to invite you to join us. Um, and we would like to improve together demand forecasting and planning. Now I'm not sure, um, Ivan, if we have time left. If so, we could also jump quickly in a solution and just show a bit of collaboration, um, or we jump directly into the Q&A session, as you prefer. That's a tough, tough question, I must say. There might, might <laughs> be some questions from the audience on uh, how you do things specifically. So let's actually uh, go to the questions, and then we'll see how it goes. Perfect. Let's right. do that. So to all the attendees, if you have questions, you can either post them in chat or raise your hand and ask. Uh, for now, I see one question and I have myself a question myself. So Caroline is asking, how do you determine what forecast is the best? Yeah, uh, let me just answer that question. So that is basically we um, do uh, cross-validation over different methodologies and we check the one which is providing uh, the lowest error, which is supposed to be the best model for that specific time series or group of time series. And initially when we are, of course, there are many uh, different forecasting methodology that we are using. When the customers are onboarding, we scan their data initially and uh, regular schedule uh, are uh, there to scan their data and try to optimize the model uh, models and forecasting engines in the background. Mm, okay, well, maybe related question to that. Uh, so in manufacturing, how are decisions made based on forecasts? So let's imagine that we have a specific product we've predicted that uh, we will sell on average 20 units and so on. What next? Yeah, most of the time they use this forecast for their production planning and raw material planning and logistic optimization. And, as, and of course, there are a lot of misinformation. Most of the time, manufacturing companies are working with sales representatives and they often have much more information than what we have in the forecasting algorithm. So the forecasts do not get every communication that between a uh, sales representative and the customer. So most of the time we have the, in our platform um, a collaboration environment where uh, people are adding their also judgmental forecasts. So overwriting functionality, so forecast value added. Uh, and to try to improve uh, the forecast accuracy even more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So, mm -hmm. and but this is goes down from from uh, different areas. For example, if you are um, in the hierarchical structure, if you are more in the in the logistic area, you use your in your logistic operations, but you can also use it in finance for controlling for budgeting and so on. And this is currently our customers is how they use it. Mm -hmm. Let me dive in a, a little bit uh, deeper into technical technicalities, if you don't mind, <laughs> sure. uh, because we have some uh, experts in, that would be interested in that. So, uh, do you <coughs> do they use point forecasts and make decisions based on that, or do they do something to get a distribution based on that? For example, I know that in, in retail it comes to safety stock, right? Calculation and safety stock mm -hmm. is based on quantile of a distribution. So is that something similar there, or how's it done? we only mm -hmm. we only provide them a forecast and uh, a confidence interval around it, and we do not really involve there with them. not currently. We do not in in uh, deriving safety. Uh, inventory and so on. This will be some project that we are working on it uh, to add also an uh, inventory uh, management or inventory um, a tool around our. our uh, so we basically uh, forecasting and then based on this forecast, they can overwrite and do their planning and the inventory. Of course, this is another mm -hmm. module that we haven't developed yet. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe to, to point out, so we get a point forecast and a probabilistic forecast around it, um, mm -hmm. which just see for the time being that most companies in manufacturing are more familiar handling a point forecast. That's mm -hmm. why this is more the, the focus, I would say, on the business side on, on, uh, from a forecasting standpoint and research standpoint. Of course, probabilistic forecasts are very interesting, but uh, it always depends on what is the team familiar with, working with, so that they can really leverage it in their SNOP or SNOE process. Yeah, it makes sense. Don't get me wrong. I'm just uh, curious because, from my perspective, you give point forecasts to the company, or they have a department that works with that, and then it goes to inventory planners who say, "I don't believe in your point forecasts, and I won't need them anyway because I, I have this idea of safety stock." There's a lot of uh, details and intricacies, so we, I don't think we, we have time to discuss all of them. Yeah. Uh, those part that we will actually try to um, uh, these problems we will try to engage us uh, uh, with in in the future. Yeah, this is also one of our product roadmap. Yeah. Sounds good. Filippo uh, is asking in the chat. Uh, so, what about time aggregation, so disaggregation on weekly data? Because that must be quite challenging, right? Because you have days that add up to weeks i guess the next level is the most difficult weeks to months okay. because the structure is not very well fixed there so how do you address that for so i think you're the expert on answering those questions <laughs> uh, sorry i did not hear there was some problems i could not hear could you yes. raise your question, please? Sure, sure so uh, when you aggregate, disaggregate in the yeah. temporal level, yeah. let's say if, uh, it's relatively easy to aggregate from daily to weekly. Yeah, it, it might be must be a headache of doing from weekly to monthly or weekly to yearly. So, do you have any I solutions there? Just give me a second. Sorry, I have some problems with the sound. And so your question was about the temporal aggregation, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, specifically about weekly and um, aggregation, uh, temporal aggregation. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is uh, that's often a problem where because uh, there are sometimes overlapping. And when we actually do temporal hierarchies, we actually uh, use the higher level as a monthly hierarchies and we disaggregate to the um, uh, daily and and that that works perfectly and weekly there there is definitely a problem because they're overlapping part and we in that case we are actually using 
three days, four days, or some uh, some other uh, frequencies to actually uh, overcome this problem. But yeah, that, that is definitely. But more established uh, processes from uh, when we are doing temporal aggregation from the forecast perspective, we disaggregate from the monthly to daily EPTs needed, and within the software solution, we have also a typical bottom up of uh, bottom-up approach where we just if we have daily data we just aggregate to the month and, and disaggregate but in a forecast process it is forecast generated on a monthly level and then disaggregate to them uh, and also a forecast created on daily level and we are then reconciling both okay mm -hmm. Good. So, so from your experience uh, that's a question from me another one from your experience, uh, when you work with the companies, what sort of reconciliation scheme is most often used? And you know, the customers feel that this is more than enough. I mean, what what we typically see is for companies um, in manufacturing that often, when they have an established solution, they say, okay, on aggregate level, the forecast looking fine. But really, when we go down on a, on a disaggregate level, it's, it's getting tricky. And typically, then we see either um, their data science team or other experts developing a bottom-up approach to handle the data. And it's, that's typically the most common case that we see really manufacturing that they then resort to a top bottom-up approach um, for dealing with the hierarchies. Mm -hmm. But uh, since you asked the most of the problem, I personally think that using the right forecast um, accuracy metric. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is quite a um, quite a uh, issue there, and often they use MAPE or some variation of MAPE, and and um, especially when you are presenting some forecast results involved with um, intermittent demand, it is quite um, difficult to actually prove that the forecast metrics that actually they're using is not good for such a data. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's uh, something I, uh, I share your pain in this respect. Let's put this <laughs> I'm sure that uh, some I, of the participants that we have share your pain as well. I think, I think <laughs> one of the one of the uh, uh, thing that to solve this issue is actually just in general to um, um, Try to actually, we are also trying to teach the customers to actually, yeah, you know, this accuracy metric is much better because of that, that, that reason. And that is one of the tricky parts because it's so established in the company or um, uh, those accuracy matrices and try to introduce a new one, which sounds much more complicated and that's quite, quite difficult. Yes. So Leonidas in the comments uh, said that the pain is real. So yeah, <laughs> several people agreeing with that. Yeah. Well, uh, having that we have this uh, uh, sort of discussion. Oh, I see the question, but let me come back to that. Uh, this sort of discussion that, uh, today. Uh, do you, when you deal with uh, practitioners, with companies and so on, do they typically know basics of forecasting? Uh, do they have statistical training and so on? What's the general impression that you have? Uh, that is very much depends on the companies. I mean, the companies that we're working with, they have uh, really uh, good uh, experts in at least in statistics and machine learning, and they do solve other problems than just forecasting. Uh, it could be inventory optimization problems, or most of them have IoT devices, uh, predictive maintenance, and they work on some sort of time series forecasting uh, domain, but not necessarily uh, directly demand forecasting or uh, shipment forecasting such areas. But they do have understanding of uh, uh, statistic and machine learning and data science in general. And we had in the beginning also customers that uh, did not have that knowledge. And in that case, it's really difficult to actually present a forecast and try to, because everybody 
I don't know who started that, but some point somebody started 99% accuracy. <laughs> and this is uh, ongoing on, on industry, especially in small companies where they do not have understanding of the forecast accuracy or uh, forecast error. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. our, our learning was like focus on, on the bigger companies which have supply chain planning excellence, which track their forecast value added, which really want to improve because they are keen on getting better and they understand how good they are and what's possible on their data. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we have, uh, I would say, relatively good experience then in comparison with what I've had uh, in some situations. So there is a question from Manas. Um, I will rephrase that if you don't mind. So <laughs> on what basis can we decide uh, where to forecast and where to do demand planning on aggregate aggregation levels? So he, he mentions that you can have, for example, statistical forecasts at the bottom level and uh, demand planning at an aggregate level, or you can have both of them at an aggregate level. So, yeah. Yeah, in general, forecast reconciliation is independent of the forecast methodology. So if you have, that's what actually we also do. And we, not necessarily that you would have a statistical forecasting on bottom level and the top level, it could be different levels that you have different type of methodology, forecasting methods or hybrid forecast. And depends on, um, that's how we do, we scan the data and the mode and the old models are also scanned through this uh, uh, optimal methodology search. And sometimes uh, it's not just best one best model, we also combine different models based on the uh, cross-validation errors. And, and so it is independent of, uh, it is independent of the forecast methodology you use. You can reconcile your forecast, um, uh, I mean, if it's a hierarchical forecast, you can reconcile uh, machine learning algorithms with deep learning methods and and uh, other method, uh, other statistical methods. But which level should be in your hierarchy? That is very much depends on your uh, business needs. I mean, if you don't need to go really uh, SKU level, you know that it is not really forecastable, or you cannot provide a reasonable value there, then don't add it. It's really based on your uh, uh, business processes. And if you are doing the logistic process and maybe you should also uh, add there uh, which kind of logistic um, provider you will use or which kind of um, uh, um, some, some, some variables that will be more informative in logistics, but if you are only using in financial terms, then don't go to product level. So it's very much depends on your stakeholders. But of course, creating one coherent forecast is very important, and that's why you need to really bring your your all stakeholders who are doing the planning and and uh, try to satisfy their need in one coherent forecast. I think what is also important is like. As Rasul mentioned, depending on the use cases, you should set up the levels. But uh, with regard to the question, it's not just that the planning that needs to happen on that level. So we typically see that we have sales representatives who typically plan on a customer sold to ship to level, but then their regional managers or demand product segment managers, then they review those forecasts, they override them to their the demand plan. So what we also offer in our solution is really to provide the collaboration across those departments to be able to review, adapt, override, uh, give your insights on different levels to come up with the best forecast. So for sales reps, of course, it's very important because they are in touch with the customer. So they, they have their customers for which they can provide the input that they have from conversations with their clients. Okay. Um... Well, if you don't mind, we can talk just a little bit about uh, the customers uh, a bit more. So um, this aligns with the survey that uh, our PhD student Carlos uh, has been trying to, to do recently. So what he has been trying to understand is what is used more often in the companies in terms of forecasting approaches and so on. 
Um, so a previous survey more than 10 years ago showed that uh, things like simple moving average or exponential smoothing are very popular in companies. And then it goes to, to more complicated methods, but more complicated methods are, uh, have been used much rarer back then. So what's your impression? Is that the same picture now or is, uh, is it changing? Yeah, and to be honest, it's actually um, uh, many companies have at least a statistical forecasting methodology and uh, methods like ARIMA exponential smoothing model, and as well as uh, typical cloud providers um, such as AWS and so on, the forecasting engine from them, they also use such complex methodologies. And uh, yeah, and they most of the companies, big companies that they have also data science teams and so on. But nonetheless, it's most of the time it's really not about forecasting, and it is basically setting up the process right. And you, and possibly you could actually use uh, for uh, open source packages and set up, but then the problem uh, occurs in. Um, in monthly forecasting cycles and bring those in a, in a in a way to the users, you know, not like a, in an Excel sheet. Some data scientists are generating forecasts and publishing somewhere, and then they use it further. But you know, creating a stable software that they can use it in their whole uh, planning cycle, and that is one of the most challenges. They do use re a complex algorithms sometimes. We have seen. Um, but uh, the main uh, the main uh, problems um, are putting this uh, software so this forecast in, in in business processes because it's not just the forecast you need to provide a platform where they can different sales per, uh, representative or different stakeholders can collaborate together and create a budget or plan and so on. And you know you have sometimes uh, a finance director make some plans or sales people making some plans and and then the manufacturing um, uh, managers are saying no we don't have that capacity and you know to just uh, adjust across all this uh, hierarchical or um, uh, company structure to create one query and forecast this is one of the uh, challenge. And we have seen also the customer using deep learning methods, and and really it is very complex mm -hmm. uh, algorithms too. Okay. By the way, they don't work. <laughs> deep <learning methods. laughs> well, that's an interesting uh, sort of additional comment to all of that. Okay, so uh, related to that, then. Uh, there were different studies showing how, how often people use judgment. Because one thing, as we've already discussed, produce forecasts, reconcile them, give them to the decision makers. But then decision makers might have some insights and they realize that the model doesn't take promotion into account or something like that. Exactly. So from your experience, what's the proportion of adjustments in, in these processes? <coughs> and so and most of the time they do not really, so far, whatever they um, adjust it, it's actually make the forecast worse, <laughs> that I can say. <laughs> and I wouldn't say that's true for all cases, but in many yeah. cases, like studies from the uh, from Lancaster University show that especially positive overrides are often not that helpful. And it very much depends on the user and how much time they contribute it to improve it because it's often to say easy okay i can improve that forecast but then you really need to do it and you don't know what the future will hold and then it becomes very tricky yeah but they do for example the case i just mentioned you know some sales people are want to sell sell more and they increase the forecast around 10 percent more and then their manager says no it's not possible because we don't have we don't have capacity and so on. So those uh, those things, and we have this approval process where everybody can write something, and then end of the month, that uh, somebody need to approve that goes into the goes into the um, business processes or whatever the planning cycle ends. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah, go ahead, Christoph. And I think it's also very important to afterwards just have the retrospective, have this forecast value added process where you look at the benchmark forecast, the system forecast, consensus forecast, and be able also to go on your customer levels and different time horizons, one month ahead, three months ahead. What is really value added? What could I contribute to that forecast? I think mm -hmm. having that possibility is also very important because otherwise uh, it's, it's often hard um, to really be tr track and be able and see what were the reasons, what was the thoughts, why did I do those adjustments um, to really learn from that and improve also the forecast. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh... Maybe we'll come back to that uh, really edit it uh, a bit later, but uh, I thought that another question aligns quite well with all of that. So uh, let's say that uh, you have this beautiful hierarchy and then a person decided to amend the forecast on whatever low level because they have some insights, some judgmental adjustment. What happens with the hierarchy because it's no longer reconciled? How do you deal with that? Should it be reconciled? If you, yes, what do you do? So I did not understand the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat Norris. Uh, so let's imagine that there is a demand planner that uh, mm -hmm. received forecasts and uh, then there is a level of uh, product, SKU or whatever, mm -hmm. and they amended that forecast because they know that promotion is coming and so on. So mm -hmm. this is this specific level, but we're mm -hmm. talking about hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Should the whole hierarchy take this into account and change? And if it yeah. does, how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, that's um, in case of the override, uh, when they're overriding, if it is a really on the bottom level and we use bottom-up approach. So mm -hmm. that is a reconciled with all other levels. Mm -hmm. But this reconciliation, so bottom-up, top-down, middle-up methodologies use, use only in generating consensus forecasts. So mm -hmm. the override functionality, but normal forecast process, forecasting engine use much more complex methodologies, such as uh, mint methodology and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the in 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 the software itself, when you override, for example, if you are in really bottom level of, uh, in one specific uh, SKU, and and that is reconciled using bottom up approach to the all other levels. And same thing, if you are going on top level, you see that the forecast have exceeded uh, the company production capacity and by 10% and you would like to reduce it and you just go there and reduce it 10% mm -hmm. uh, or give a specific number. And then this is also reconciled to the bottom. Okay. But it's maybe yeah. also important to mention there um, often the situation that you don't have the information on a weekly or monthly level, so we can also have overrides on, on a quarterly level and we also distributed exactly. them back considering the seasonal fluctuations to lower uh, temporal um, hierarchy levels like weekly, for example, and considering also the levels and also what we have seen for many companies in manufacturing. My PCS rep, he knows very well what the customer will buy the next month. And then afterwards, his regional manager comes and wants to adjust it on top level. So we also give them the possibility that they can freeze individual combinations where they're very sure that exactly this will be the case. Then they're saved from overrides and they will not be overwritten anymore. But the rest basically will be adjusted when the manager makes on, on top level an override afterwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. I guess the main challenge would be if you use more advanced uh, techniques as results set, uh, like mean T shrink, shrink and things like that. Right. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm aware of time. When yeah, there it is. And just one comment about that. There, when you are using you know, uh, um, methods in uh, directly override functionality, not in the forecasting process, but an override process. If you use methodologies such as Mint or other methodologies, then you might need to residuals where you don't have actually anymore and they're not representative. And of course, methodologies such as OLS or uh, weighted OLS can be still used. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we haven't seen such a huge increase. Uh, it's also about performance issue, not rather than technical, but you know, it should be fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So take, taking a small step back and coming back to the forecast value added and things like that. 
So you've already mentioned the uh, MAP um, and the struggle of explaining what the better measures are. So from your experience, what is the easiest error measure to explain to practitioners uh, and that that measure needs to be you know, appropriate and not too bad? <laughs> Yeah, that would be the weighted map because any other methodology is really difficult to mm -hmm. and difficult to explain and also um, try to implement in their processes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, bias or weighted map, I think so. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, there, you probably know that there are some papers showing that bias uh, aligns very well with some inventory decisions. So it's a, indeed a very useful matter to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, well, I think I interrogated you enough <laughs> with all the questions. Uh, I don't see any questions from the audience. So I guess we can probably close on that. Uh, thanks very much for coming and uh, presenting. Thanks everyone, everyone who joined us, for joining us. And uh, that's it for today. The next webinar will be in December and it will be on exponential smoothing. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you, bye. bye. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.